thanks very much to the uh, organizers for uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, it's interesting to think about diagnostics. Uh, uh, in the um, setting of what we just heard, clearly the rock stars of the scientific enterprise here uh, are the people developing the new therapeutics, the people that are going to uh, cure, uh, cure the diseases that we've been talking about. And it kind of leaves the people doing diagnostics a little bit as the roadies uh, on the uh, spectrum of the uh, rock star uh, therapists. And in fact, uh, of course, as uh, pathologists or radiologists, we're typically relegated to the sub-basements or uh, back rooms of the uh, enterprise. Uh, and uh, even our development officers know it's a heck of a lot easier to raise money uh, for somebody that's, uh, uh, say, cured uh, your cancer than uh, the person that told you you had cancer. Uh, so uh, diagnostics uh, uh, has its challenges. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, uh, clearly of fundamental importance, and I'd like to believe that there's a reason that they uh, uh, chose to lead off the detailed panels uh, with uh, diagnostics here. First, um, diagnostic errors are a huge part of the problems that we have in delivery of healthcare. The uh, Harvard Medical Practice Study showed so somewhere upwards of 20% uh, uh, of preventable errors in hospitalization uh, 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 settings uh, are caused by uh, diagnostic errors. Uh, so we have a huge contribution to make to uh, lower that. Um, second, uh, there have been uh, lots of discussions uh, around uh, the notion of uh, eliminating disease. The uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, I think their phrase was uh, to cure, manage, and prevent disease. Uh, but clearly, especially in the setting of the diseases that we're talking about uh, this morning, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, it's fair to say that the uh, ounce of prevention is worth uh, well more than the pound of cure. Uh, the analogy is kind of like the Titanic. If you don't uh, you know, discover the problem until you're uh, right upon it, uh, you need pretty dramatic uh, changes, and the consequences of, uh, of uh, missing uh, are, uh, are pretty severe. But if you can spot the problem from long enough away, just a small change in course can allow you to circumvent those problems. And that clearly is going to challenge how we do our diagnostics, but it puts a real incentive and uh, pushes uh, to earlier and earlier uh, our need to understand where our individual patients are in terms of their own uh, molecular and biological processes. Um, and third, of course, uh, we heard uh, Al talk about uh, the model of using biomarkers, uh, imaging uh, diagnostics uh, as a way to uh, guide therapies. Uh, the notable example, notable success of this, of course, has been in the area uh, of multiple sclerosis, and uh, that's been a, a, a huge contributor to the fact that we have so many uh, drugs uh, which are uh, showing increasing uh, uh, efficacy uh, in that disease. Um, but of course, it's going to be a challenge now to extend that same model to uh, other neurodegenerative or uh, even uh, neurodevelopmental processes. Uh, so uh, with that background in mind, uh, I'd like to first turn to my uh, panelists and have them uh, introduce themselves, just give a little bit of background before we get into the details of the discussion. Why don't we start with you, Roger? <coughs> Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Roger Gunn. So my background is uh, originally applied mathematician. Uh, I've spent 20 years working in both academia and pharma, so really focusing with uh, positron emission tomography, so molecular imaging, developing traces that can be applied for disease understanding and for actually answering questions in drug development. So I'm currently based at a company in London called Imanova Limited, and we actually do half our work with London-based academics and half with big pharma answering questions for them. So it's, it's a really nice environment where there's a bi-directional exchange in terms of innovation coming from academia and also from industry, allowing us to really concentrate on developing markers that are going to be useful, particularly looking to develop novel markers and validate them such that we can uh, find tools that are going to be useful earlier and earlier in the disease process. Okay. Robert? Yeah, my name is Robert Krieg and I work for Siemens Health Seniors and I'm responsible for the innovations in MRI from our companies. And um, when what has been the strife uh, and the aspiration for my work in the past years was to expand MRI from the pure morphology or anatomical um, display of, of structures into uh, functional aspects of the brain, of, of the whole body. And um, this is uh, something where MRI did 
a great job in the past years of uh, really supplying values, say, on functional activity in the brain. Uh, as you may have, se you may have seen these uh, fantastic visualize uh, or visualities of the fiber tracts uh, that can be done with MRI. Those are all functional aspects already beyond extending beyond uh, morphology. And uh, recent uh, innovation we brought to the market was an integration with the true molecular discipline of um, um, of pet pro uh, positron emission tomography. Um, and this is integrated into one system or can be integrated into one system. Good morning, I'm Jacob Hooker. I'm a chemical biologist by training and the way I approach neuroscience is by thinking about neurochemical interactions and neurochemical dynamics in the brain. Uh, unfortunately, in the living human brain, we have very few tools uh, that exist uh, to even study those chemical interactions. And so a big part of my research lab focus at Massachusetts General Hospital is to develop those tools to provide insights into the neurochemistry and dysfunction that exists um, as, a, as a consequence of age or, or, or disease. Um, and so the tool I use uh, is, is uh, simultaneous MRI and, and, and positron emission mammography that comes from the innovations uh, originally uh, out of Siemens. And we try and connect neurochemistry to brain function. So we use and develop neuro neurochemical tools, but then try and make sure that we apply those in a context that relates to what we understand about structure, structural dysregulation and, and function uh, using, using the MRI piece of the equation. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Eddie Martucci. I'm a CEO of Achille Interactive. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. For those that don't know, Achille is a digital therapeutics company. Um, and so what we do is take algorithms that can display motor and sensory stimulus uh, into digital environments, things like iPads and phones, for traditionally treatment uh, response or treatment efficacy. And so we have um, a range of treatment products that are deployed on these mobile devices uh, that through sensory and motor stimulus can target specific neurological systems in, in areas like ADHD. Um, we're moving into neurodegeneration. Uh, the relevance for this panel is actually a, a bit of a newer product um, class for us, which we call our screens and monitors. Um, and this is applying those same type of sensory algorithms, which I forgot to mention, the, the part that gets us covered most in the press is that the front end of our platform um, is actually action video games. So we can take these sensory algorithms, throw them into uh, action video games, and we actually have an office in San Francisco in the US of all game developers, um, but we are a medical device company. Um, and so we're, we're leveraging that kind of rapid, uh, adaptive sensory stimulus through action video games and now pointing that at short bursts to activate very quickly neurological systems and see if we get um, a screening response, an ability to stratify patients. And so we're starting to do that across uh, neurological areas, specifically starting in neurodegeneration. Um, we uh, have had a multi-year collaboration with Pfizer, um, and Pfizer just had presented some data at CTAD in December <laughs> Um, around some of our digital biomarkers, our fast-paced assessments that seem to correlate in healthy individuals with amyloid status. So in a blinded way, positive or negative amyloid in entirely healthy individuals, and we see some correlation with um, sort of totally non-invasive digital uh, signatures. We're continuing to evolve that work and that analysis, uh, and we're moving into areas like multiple sclerosis and others currently. And my name is Henrik Zetterberg. I started out as a lead guitarist of uh, Double Surprise, a band in, in uh, Gothenburg. <laughs> but then I developed backwards and I got to play the bass. Now I carry stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a secret plan, and that is to become their manager. That's my, yeah. but that's uh, all the, it's for us here. I thought I stole the show with video games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah, why yeah, 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 no, no. Um, and on the side, I work on fluid biomarkers for the pathologies that, we discussed, that was, were discussed a bit earlier in the, in the previous session. Uh, fluid biomarkers for key pathologies of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases in collaboration with many of you guys and also with the molecular imaging people, although we compete a bit, but uh, that's, uh, I think it's a healthy competition, yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. I work at University of Gothenburg and University College London. Fantastic, okay, so as you can uh, see, a, a pretty diverse uh, group of people uh, on the stage, <laughs> rock stars included, which is uh, great to know. Um, and as I looked at the group, I you know, saw kind of a, a diversity, uh, you know, kind of starting at the molecular level uh, and then uh, moving all the way up to you know, uh, behavior, the uh, end result of what the molecules are uh, put in place to do. But let's start at the molecular level. 
Uh, Roger, uh, maybe uh, people can uh, just focus. I just had a question for you first. Uh, uh, what's the tracer uh, that uh, is on my tie here? Can you see that? Uh, I'm not sure what it is. That's OK either. Um, we need some careful analysis. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, uh, give us a sense for where we are today in terms of tracers specifically targeting uh, neurodegeneration, uh, uh, neuroinflammation. Uh, you know, kind of what's the, what's the state of the art? So I guess where we've come from in about 15 years ago, we started developing the amyloid tracers, and we've done that successfully. So we now have four good agents that will allow you to image amyloid in the brain. They're fairly equivalent. Um, you know, they're approved by the FDA and the like. So that's been successful. They're, they're selective for amyloid, amyloid plaques um, at that level. Where we're moving to is now we're in the field of developing tau agents. So whilst looking at amyloid, it's, it's a question in terms of how useful that is as a biomarker. We can certainly, it's being used a lot at the moment in terms of stratification for entry into trials, but also to some level for readouts, and we, we've also heard about the aducanumab data earlier on. So, but people are looking for better, more sensitive markers that are gonna provide more, more important readouts for, for their drugs. And so tau is one area that, that is coming along, but it's, it's been a challenge. It's, so amyloid's quite a high density. Tau is a lower density. So developing these traces, you have to have more selectivity. And we've seen some in the last year fall by the wayside due to selectivity issues. But there are a number of two or three really good tau agents that are about to hit the scene. So that's coming out in terms of those things. What else can we do in terms of, <clears throat> if we look at neuroinflammation, um, I guess it's people have looked at this with regard to traces such as TSPO, so the trans trans uh, translocator protein, uh, which measures activate, activated microglia. But I think we really haven't hit a good neuroinflammation tracer. It's a complicated one. So whereas if you look at amyloid, people will agree that is a pure signal for amyloid so, plaques. So, so that's a domain where uh, we've made a lot of progress, uh, maybe neuroinflammation, tau areas that we need, um, you know, still more work. Yeah. Jacob, do you want to uh, talk about uh, where you see uh, some of these things? You've also <laughs> been uh, uh, playing around with the neuroinflammatory markers, and, and, and what else, uh, you know, can we be imagining? Sure. You know, I, I'm struck by the earlier conversation and Kate's comment that there are 170 some odd targets. If you look at the National Institute for Mental Health's uh, website, they've got a, a, a sort of tracer database they trust list. There's only 34, last I counted, 34 targets that we can reasonably address in the human brain with PET. And if I take that list and, and put my own skeptical eye to it, I would say about half of those I would, I would trust to take forward in some sort of trial capacity. Um, and so for all of the targets that we could be approaching in dimension-related diseases, um, you, you know, we have very, very few tools to study them. I think neuroinflammation, um, first and foremost, has to be defined to know how to go after a tracer. And so the way we think about defining neuroinflammation is in cellular phenotype. I think that's where the field is moving. So that we can ascribe some molecular target, some molecular signature we see to some cellular function. Um, and so we're going after two concepts, one, early activation of microglia. The agents we have actually currently, the TSPO ligands that Roger was describing, are unselective for microglia um, over astrocytes. Um, we're going after more microglial selective agents. I think many people are. But the other area we're going is in um, uh, disruption of microglial homeostasis. So moving from, uh, away from the healthy brain concept of what microglia are doing to sort of the earliest forms of of where activation is, is sort of localizing to either pathogenic effect or, or trauma uh, location. Great. Uh, Henrik, so you kind of come at it, uh, uh, you know, less from the standpoint of uh, taking a picture, but uh, with a much uh, deeper range of molecular information than you can get at a single shot. Tell us a little bit about uh, where we are and uh, wh where uh, you imagine uh, the challenges are uh, to, to press the ball forward. Yep. Um, I work with fluid biomarkers, then we work a lot with cerebrospinal fluid, where we can rather well now assess tau and amyloid pathology in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so, and recently also, um, there have been developments in assays. So this year, the first fully 
automated assays for uh, beta amyloid 1 to 42 will be released. And this will mean that you can have your patient in the office, you can interview the patient and the relatives, perform a lumbar puncture, and then after, after half an hour you will get uh, the amyloid result back in the office. But that necessitates that you perform a lumbar puncture. That is, uh, to me, that is, uh, I'm coming from Sweden, and that we do it on anyone, uh, always. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, from medical students to, to uh, patients. And uh, so with the thin needles, that it, this is rather easy. I must say that one should demystify the lumbar puncture. But I realize that that means still it's a procedure and that is uh, done in different manners in, in uh, different parts of the world also. Um, in Sweden, that is part of general uh, practice, sort of. Uh, are, there any, are there any kind of uh, folks uh, approaching kind of uh, advanced technologies to make that uh, you know faster, easier, more robust. Yeah. So, so the advanced technologies that appear now are fully automated assays on general clinical chem chemistry instruments, and that will allow us for, for uh, getting global cut points and also uh, more reliable results over time. Um, we have, um, together with Alzheimer's Association, launched uh, an external control. A quality control program, and that really shows that the, the, the old techniques, the regular LISAs, they work reasonably well, uh, but these new fully automated platforms will allow for having uh, inter-assay variability over time in the range from two to five, perhaps six percent, and that is good for, for, uh, from a clinical chemistry standpoint. Uh, I mean, when we talked about liver tests before, that is uh, uh, they have a little bit lower variation, but not not much lower. Uh, so I think this is um, I think this is almost a reality now. But we want to make these into blood tests, of course, and that has proven much harder, uh, because, for example, for beta amyloid, we have extra cerebral production of beta amyloid that obscures the plasma results. Uh, we have um, for, for tau, we have some kind of strange t kinetics going on in the blood when we measure with ultra sensitive new technique. We can measure tau, but it doesn't correlate well with, with the cerebrospinal fluid levels and not that well with, with um, uh, imaging data of tau pathology either. For, neuro, for neurodegeneration, we have a marker, which is called neurofilament light, and that is, to my knowledge, the first reliable blood biomarker for neurodegeneration. It works excellently well in multiple sclerosis. It responds to therapy. It's increased in frontotemporal dementia, ALS, Alzheimer's, but to a lesser degree, and uh, I think that potentially could have some use in in uh, general practice if the, the assays become better, because that's a special assay now. So, Henrik, you've uh, uh, actually published on comparisons between the performance in a clinical setting of uh, uh, of PET imaging, uh, you know, versus uh, CSF. What's What's your view about that? Can I start a fight between the people in the audience here? <laughs> <laughs> it is the, no the the, the, the results. I think actually one could say very objectively that when looking at all the literature, CSF A beta 1 to 42, especially when taking a ratio with A beta 40 and amyloid PET, they give very similar information. But in, I must, from a diagnostic standpoint, but in response to therapy, from my perspective, CSF um, A beta protein concentrations are very hard to interpret. I, 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 would, I, I actually do not really know if an effective amyloid targeting treatment would result in decreased or increased, decreased or increased uh, CSFA beta 42 concentrations. But amyloid, the amyloid PET signal should go, go down. So that, from my perspective, in response to treatment, amyloid PET should be easier to interpret than the fluids. Roger or uh, Jacob, do you want to uh, weigh in on the where you see the role for uh, uh, imaging uh, versus uh, you know, fluid uh, assessment? Well, I was, I was very curious to think about how um, you know, CSF lumbar puncture is approaching um, neuroinflammation as a concept. I mean, obviously, you can measure cytokine and, and related sort of pro-inflammatory elements. Um, how do you interpret that relative to, say, uh, anatomical localization? Or you know, how, are you, how is your field approaching uh, neuro neuroinflammation as a concept? Anatomical localization is the main drawback of the fluids, of course. And then you will also, if you have uh, release of proteins that come from healthy tissue, that will also, of course, make it harder to interpret the results. So um, what, there are possibilities of measuring, for example, microglial proteins. TREM2 can be measured in cerebrospinal fluid. On the group level, you see increased concentrations in lumbar CSF for, for 80 patients. Um, in regards to markers of pathology, 
I think most researchers in the fluid biomarker field try to find protein species that are pathology enriched. So that you, for example, we, currently we lack TDP43 and alpha synuclein biomarkers. If you measure alpha synuclein in cerebrospinal fluid, most of that signal will come from red blood cells and, and uh, plasma. And so, but if you could find a fragment or an isoform that builds up specifically in the levy bodies, then perhaps one could create an ultra sensitive assay that would work in a fluid in parallel with the uh, imaging. Yeah, so I, I think one key um, differentiation over time is going to be what we can actually address with PET. Uh, typically has to be a, a, a small molecule, addressable target, typically a, a drug, druggable target. You know, we start from the richness of medicinal chemistry that's going out there for therapeutic, and, and there are many, many proteins that have been implicated or are being studied in disease that, that, at least within the next decade landscape, I just don't see us being able to get to with imaging. And so I think uh, we have to be really strategic to make sure we're making the right bets for PET and otherwise relying on... So, let, so let me pose a question that was uh, actually posed... Uh, uh, by the audience, so uh, the question is, you know, since synapse loss is the closest correlate to dementia symptoms, you know, what do we think about either a synaptic PET tracer uh, or synaptic markers of CSF? Roger, you want to jump in there? <clears throat> yeah, so actually, we've got a pretty competitive consortium uh, just been established at MNOVA. We're working with funding from MRC industry as well, where we're about to look at uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, three traces in, in a range of individuals and in different diseases one of them being a, a new tracer called UCBJ, which actually will measure synaptic density. There's been some really exciting uh, work published recently on this by the Yale group. So this tracer was, they did some nice validation work in primates, mm -hmm. showing actually this comes very close to an in vivo synaptophysin. Mm -hmm. And there's some early data coming out of Yale which shows big signal changes in AD, 50% reduction in signal. MCI, 25% reduction in signal. So these are, these are big, exciting some, changes. Some encouragement. Yeah, so uh, I think that could be important. Yeah. So, Eddie, I want to uh, bring you in. Because obviously, uh, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, um, you know, kind of a, a hierarchy of, uh, of diagnostics uh, and trying to push to earlier and earlier states, uh, um, you know, PET scans or even, uh, you know, uh, lumbar punctures uh, uh, obviously have a, a certain burden associated with them. You've got a, a kind of a different approach. How far do you think you can push it? How good do you think those correlates are? And do you see it uh, more as just a, an early screen, or can you go beyond that by your measures of behavior? Yeah, um, we don't know yet is the answer, we in the global sense. Um, the hardest thing, I think, that, and, and it's, you can even see in the responses, we haven't stretched over the line yet to correlating to function. It came up at the end of the last panel. Um, that's not hard to do in advanced disorder in any neurodegenerative condition. It's pretty binary. Um, but we know as we push earlier, we have a hard time correlating with function. And I don't mean activities of daily living or sort of like three-step removed function, um, which is continue, going to continue to be a problem. Um, but we can do things that are giving us early allusions to function at the neurological level. It's interesting you mentioned synaptic loss, and we say, well, what blood biomarkers can we get from synaptic loss? We were having a conversation last night, synaptic loss or any neurological burden. You should start to see subtle neurological dysfunction. Not necessarily that, you know, I can't walk properly. But if I'm in a high cognitive load environment, then you know, we, we stress a cognitive load spectrum, and you can see something within there. And so um, what we're trying to do, and, and a number of other companies now are trying to do, are to apply early, what I'd call early sort of pseudo-functional outcomes, things like cognitive behavioral um, activation patterns um, where the brain is trying to do something. Uh, as opposed to just looking at what's the pathology. Um, and we're going to need that. I mean, quite frankly, I think we all understand this, that as we go earlier and earlier, it's not just a clinical trials problem. It's, um, God forbid, a market problem when we spend all this money and all these resources and we get a amyloid or other targeting agent to market in an early population. Uh, we're going to need to find those people. If we, have a, uh, if we need to find an early marker of an MS uh, sort of uh, trough and spike, um, we're going to want to find those people as early as possible. So um, I think you're starting to see research on digital and you know, both active technologies like ours, kind of fast-paced action, active environments, but also passive technologies. There's some really interesting data at universities right now in uh, voice analytics. Um, so early both sort of motor and cognitive um, impacts of voice that I think will be the connective thread between um, pathology between physiology and the earliest steps of outcome. 
Um, the stage we're at right now as an industry, as best as I can see it, is that we have one-off or two-off trials that imply a nice correlation in some populations, and not all. Um, and I think the other problem is, as a, as a research community, for a long time we've been studying kind of moderate or mild to moderate, and so that correlation is there. The question is, how much is that correlation there in the prodromal or the early transitional phase? Um, you know, we have a study there, a few other companies and research groups are starting to have studies there, so uh, I believe we need more attention towards that. Um, and what I see is, I don't think it's unfortunate, but I'll use that word, that the standard setting, even nomenclature, we're actually starting to kind of dissociate that, right? We're saying, well, there's, there's pathological burden, like amyloid, um, and then there's functional consequences, and we're almost drawing a rift between that. Um, but I think with sort of digital technologies, we can actually start to connect that, and we should be doing that in the earliest research studies. I don't think we should be waiting until there's like a phase two or phase three pharma trial. I think in the earliest research trials, we should be integrating these technologies and looking at those correlations. So speak, speaking I, about I, that, I want to just bring Robert uh, into the conversation because we talked last night about the ability to actually understand what's happening at a system neuroscience level, what uh, you know, uh, subjects are actually doing when they're doing these tests. Um, where does uh, the uh, uh, MR scanner stand now in terms of generating kind of quantitative and reliable data? Because uh, uh, obviously MR is uh, you know, our, our widest used diagnostic tool routinely in the clinic, uh, a very versatile tool anatomy and measures of function, and yet, you know, kind of the rap on MR has always been, you know, it's not really quantitative, it's hard to get, you know, solid biomarkers out of it. What, is that an emerging uh, uh, element of uh, research? What's Siemens, for example, doing in that domain? <clears throat> so you're totally right, Bruce. Uh, historically, the, even, even the reads of an MR and the reports uh, that were produced were very fluffy and, and, and not very hard to quantify. Fluffy, I'm going to remind, <laughs> remember that next time my chairman uh, asks me to redo my reports. <laughs> Too fluffy. So, so there is clearly a, a trend and a tendency to come up with a structured reports yeah, that have hard uh, quantifiable numbers. Uh, MRI is still suffering from the fact that all our Quantifications are somewhat semi-quantitative, so we are good if, if we compare a prior measurement with a later measurement because there is, uh, there is uh, reliability in the data per machine uh, in itself, but uh, absolute quantification is, is a harder uh, thing to crack. Yeah? And there's some so is, is that something we can uh, expect to see in the future? And what are the kind of, is it a technical uh, problem in the hardware, the engineering? Uh, is it a data science uh, problem, uh, some combination of the two? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, to some extent a problem of the, the hardware per se. I mean, CT, uh, another modality, is measuring Hounsfield units. This is, this is very, very clear. In MRI, from the technology, we are measuring proton density, typically, and, and there are thousands of factors influencing this. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means then that even uh, systems uh, across vendors are not comparable because they may have... Uh, dif use different definitions uh, in their sequences of these typical values, uh, repetition time, echo time, and so on. But there, there are new approaches uh, like uh, fingerprinting MRI, which uh, got a Nature publication uh, a few years ago. Um, this is a method uh, that would that allows, in principle, to highly, really highly, and uh, increase the the uh, accurateness of the measures, uh, so that we think. With this kind of approaches, we can probably really um, have absolute T1, T2 values and relaxivity in futures. That, on the other hand, then the vision is that with these uh, highly pro reproducible T1 and T2 values, we can probably cl even classify disease patterns, yeah? So that we see, really see, okay, here's a, a lesion, and this usually is tumor. This, this is where the data science uh, element yeah, exactly. comes in. Just kind of on a related point, and I'll open this. Uh, this is a toss-up question for the group. Uh, you know, can we bring in other disciplines to push the limits of detection and sensitivity in the search for biomarkers? So, who wants to uh, I'll say, that one? I'll just say that the need we have, one, one need we have in positive random emission tomography is temporal resolution. You know, Eddie made a great point about, you know, challenging cognitive system and making a measurement during sort of that challenge state, the heavy load state. We don't do that very well in, in at least positron emission tomography. I, mean, I would say much, much better in functional MRI. And that's because we don't have the temporal resolution to operate at the scale that neurotransmission occurs. You know, we do a 60 to 90 minute scan to infer a state function of the brain 
or trait function of the brain uh, more often, um, we're not really doing dynamic neurochemical imaging by any stretch of the imagination at this point. So I think we could use um, a lot of collaborative uh, investment in, in those kinds of areas. Oh, Roger. Just going to say, I think it's all about understanding the strengths of all these different techniques. And it's like PET doesn't have the optimal temporal resolution, but what it does is have biological and chemical resolution. Peak molar sensitivity and being able to develop agents that are truly selective for a particular molecular target. And that's pretty valuable. So if you can develop something that makes the most of that and provides a quantitative readout on that, it can be used effectively. Mm -hmm. And I just, just one other point to that, in terms of what else can you bring to this, I think in terms of the development of these novel traces, they're tough. It's like a mini drug development program. Mm -hmm. And I think it's being smart about actually bringing in the right expertise in terms of bioinformatics, chemistry, and biology to really focus on that program to start with. So one, actually, yeah. uh, just to take on both of those points, one challenge that we'll have, and then put a challenge out to us, um, a challenge that we'll have is obviously saying, let's get any technology to be in the time domain that you know, we need it, and obviously that could be decades in the making. However, I think we do actually have technologies today that can span whatever time domain we need, right? So from, not, not for every type of modality. Sure. But if you connected those, right, if in trials we're actually connecting, you know, from, the, from maybe the, the most fast-paced, you know, we've got um, EEG-type technology. Yeah, we talked about right? electrophysiology. Talked about uh, over exactly. So you have, where, where does that fit in? Yeah, well, you have electrophysiology. We have, you know, on our digital platform, we leverage everything that Apple has spent a whole lot of money and time in, and we collect data on the frame rate of the device, so 30 times a second. You get similar resolution in EEG, and then you can stretch up to measurements that are minutes and, and then tens of minutes and hours. If you connect all that, um, I think there's uh, utility. So to your question, Bruce, you know, where do we stand on something like electrophysiology? I think it's exactly within my statement. It's one slice of that puzzle. Um, and we have lots of research groups that are trying to perfect every slice and industry like us trying to per, per, uh, perfect a single slice. But let's connect all that, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, um, sure, it's, there's constraints and trials of money and, and obviously uh, time with the patient. Um, but it feels like we were having, Jacob and I, a nice conversation last night. It feels like there are some really low-hanging fruit opportunities to just get some of these technologies in, in trials that are running patients pretty efficiently, um, get a little bit more connectivity between these types of measurements. It, it's one of the, uh, the great utilities of the kind of tools that you're uh, talking about is that they can be ubiquitously, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, disseminated and, uh, and the data collected. Well, and the point uh, is you if can, you have correlation we, with then clinical sort of, you know, hard, long measurements. Um, you, you, that's, can, that's you can imagine, uh, you know, subjects uh, uh, doing this evaluation while they're in the waiting room, waiting for their MR or PET scan or uh, to bend over and, uh, you know, get their <laughs> CSF tap. Distract them from the lumbar puncture. <laughs> exactly. So there's a question. I, I could just comment oh, also sure, from please. a fluid biomarker standpoint, the uh, answer to the question if we need to collaborate across these means is uh, clear yes, so course. And that is, um, uh, I see one very exciting field is, of course, ultra sensitivity and molecule counting. That is one where we really need to work with physicists and, and um, engineers. And, and uh, yeah, I, I shouldn't continue to. Yeah. Uh, then we have multiplexing. I do not like multiplexing myself, but um, uh, that is, of course, something which is uh, coming. Um, the, the, the problem, as I see it, as a clinical chemist also working with patient samples, is that when you have uh, many, many analytes and you try to measure them, at least with the current techniques, it is hard to standardize that in a, uh, at least for me, understandable manner. But th there could be new, new measurement techniques that would account for that also. But is, is that an engineering problem or something fundamental to the biology? I think uh, it is like this. When you try to measure one molecule very, in a very sensitive and specific manner, you optimize that assay for years. And then when you try to measure seven molecules, you start to measure seven molecules slightly suboptimally. And then there could be uh, confounders that affect the measurement reader. So you have to be very careful in the multiplexed uh, panels. But I think this is coming still, so it's just me being a bit conservative. Uh, um, th then we have another uh, area where we need to collaborate much more, and that is to, to increase the interpretability of the markers, because we do understand, we think a beta rather well now, 
but we do not understand tau, we do not understand, for example, the synaptic marker, neurogranin, the, the, the CSF concentrations of neurogranin in a dendritic protein, they are increased in Alzheimer's disease, but we do not know if that is secretion or degeneration. And there we need to work with cell biologists and animal model experts and, and try to figure out how um, tau, neurogranin and other uh, proteins respond to AD pathology in different means and contribute perhaps to also. So I'm going to bring another question in from the group, actually try to uh, combine two. The question is, uh, how can PET ligands to specific neurotransmitter or neuroinflammatory targets inform on patient uh, subpopulation? That's really the, you know, the theme, and the question is, is it a fruitful path forward? And I'll just say the next question was, you know, great progress has been made in uh, you know, uh, studying the circuits underlying learning and memory. Are there opportunities in functional imaging uh, you know, to uh, study learning and plasticity as a probe? And, of course, that could be with MR or it could be with cognitive. So kind of open to all of you. Uh, are, are the markers to the point where we can really begin to stratify patients, uh, um, you know, to uh, help our therapeutic uh, partners, uh, you know, try to, uh, you know, have a greater hit rate and uh, try to be more focused in their studies? Are, are we to that point yet? I'll, I'll, I'll try and start. This concept that um, we talked about a minute ago on fingerprinting, fingerprinting MRI, um, is a really powerful concept that a lot of the things we're measuring in neuroimaging and this includes neuroinflammation, uh, seem to be a trait of an individual brain. If you scan someone with our second generation TSPO ligands and you bring them back healthy or non-progressing disease six months later, you scan them again, the maps are amazingly consistent. Um, Unfortunately, we just don't know how to interpret it. So I think to get to the Typically point... Typically, when we see studies across populations, we see these big error bars. And what you're saying is... That's cross-sectional. That's the... It's all cross-sectional. It's cross-sectional. Yeah. And so I think the re... one of the real challenges in moving toward individualized uh, you know, strategies toward enrollment or subpopulation segregation is the concept of reverse translation, that we, we push molecules forward to humans, um, you know, Quite a, quite a bit now, and that's, that's what drives us to, to, to the innovation pipeline. Uh, we're not doing as much in the reverse direction, taking a signal and dissecting it um, in the reverse direction uh, adequately. So um, uh, 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 another question that uh, came in is related to one of the questions that we posed in the original panel. So uh, we talked about uh, the notion of uh, trying to de-risk biomarker development. Uh, in part because of the reimbursement structure of uh, diagnostics uh, you know, being perhaps uh, less favorable than therapeutics. Uh, if you're going to make that investment, you really need to uh, um, you know, think carefully about uh, how you make it. Uh, and the question is that you know, there are hundreds of uh, different competing individual groups working to develop uh, diagnostics in dementia. You know, how do we make this more efficient? So in general, how are we going to take either the development of a new PET probe or uh, uh, you know, a new panel of uh, fluids or uh, new MR behavioral measures uh, and uh, uh, try to uh, you know, uh, uh, smooth the friction in the pipeline so that we can get uh, you know, uh, more of these uh, uh, understood and out there uh, you know, for use. Maybe we can start on that one. I think there's two questions there. One is how can we do this better and de-risk them earlier sort of thing? And how can we do them such that all this great work isn't going on in isolation in different companies. I mean, Tau is a great example of that with probably 15 different companies I know of all having their own Tau development programs. With great scientists doing great work, it's not particularly efficient. But I think coming back to how do we develop better pet ligands, I think it's thinking about how we can answer some important questions to start with. De-risking them. We've got some, uh, there's biomathematical tools out there now which allow you to model things like non-specific binding, which is background signal which kills a load of, of ligands, understanding what the density of the target is, what affinity you need. All of this stuff can be done in silico with some in vitro information to actually give yourself a, an answer about, is this target tractable for imaging with these types of compounds? And if not, what type of compound should we be looking for? I think those things are important. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, if I may add uh, to this, so we also see, clearly see a big problem uh, in this in this whole um, way to reimburse uh, any of our new biomarkers. Um, this is really hampering the whole development from our point of view. 
I mean, if you look at uh, imaging agents uh, or uh, f like like uh, special contrast media for MI, I mean, the, the, the industry has really cl clearly stepped out of this, yeah. On the pet tracer side, it's uh, fortunately a little bit better. <laughs> There's some activity remaining. The only way I see us really getting out of this trap is by closer collaboration with the insurers uh, and, and uh, with all involved partners. In, in this t term of outcome sense. I think what I learned here from the UK system, uh, where the NICE uh, allowed early, much earlier state uh, tracers to be deployed to, to patients yeah, and then really surveying the outcomes, I think that's the right approach um, because the, the classical model of, of l l running long-term trials just won't work, uh, especially for our industry. This is not a, a viable business model. Um, uh, the um uh, one of the uh, examples brought up in the uh, last session was, uh, or at the opening session, was the uh, ADNI trial, the ADNI, uh, as kind of a pre-competitive space where uh, you know both uh, uh, academia, foundations, and industry work together to get this uh, basic knowledge. Can you imagine, uh, you know, kind of a, a pre-competitive uh, uh, consortium to begin to pull this data together across large numbers of subjects, perhaps using the informatics tools that we've heard a number of you talk about? Is that feasible, or is that a pipe dream? I think it's happening now also, it's happening. But, but the one thing I... In 10 seconds. Ten, okay, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I just wanted to mention very briefly that I think biomarker development could be made inherent to any basic research project also. So those of you who work in basic science, uh, please consider also biomarker aspects of the, the work you're doing because then perhaps that could be a way of de-risking uh, biomarker development and to have it all. And, Collaborate. Yeah, I think we're we're seeing even you know I'm I'm one of the sort of company representatives and as a startup would tend to be very walls off to competition, but us and a lot of other startups are even uh, seeing uh, gathering together because we want to know where our technologies work best. Um, and so, for instance, the, the you know A4 A5 group out of Brigham and Women's. Uh, I know there's folks here. Um, there are different groups coming in that are presumably possibly competitive, but I think there's enough groundswell momentum that people want to know where their technologies, tracers, et cetera, work, and, um, and, and we should all be supporting that. And I think in this area, there's been so much uh, disappointment that we are seeing that, whereas in some other, in, in Alzheimer's, um, whereas in some other areas we have not. Okay, so I see the flashing light. I see Chris is going to run off with our gifts, and we're going to miss the opportunity to get them unless we say uh, <laughs> it's uh, all over. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and excellent questions.